Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. During the Second World War, a church in Strasbourg was destroyed. When the members of the congregation met together to inspect the damage caused by the bombing, they found that the entire roof had fallen in, leaving a heap of rubble and broken glass. Much to their surprise, however, a statue with outstretched arms that had been carved centuries before by a great artist was still standing erect. It was virtually unharmed except that both hands had been sheared off by a falling beam. The people of the congregation made inquiries with a local sculptor whether the hands could be replaced. He said that they could and was even willing to do the work for free. The congregation discussed this incredible offer, yet decided against it stating that they felt that the statue without hands was the greatest illustration possible that God's work was done through people. We are His hands and feet and mouth and eyes. As we've often heard, it's not our ability that God uses, but our availability. This is Set Free with Ken Legg. And the fact that he uses ordinary people is kind of comforting, knowing especially, Ken, that uh, God will use us not because of us, but often in spite of us, gives us great hope. That's true. And uh, we, a point that we've noticed, Phil, is that God, it seems, has gone out of his way to get that point across. It's not about you. It's not about you having to qualify or impress me or do great things so that I'll use you. I don't do superstars. Uh, I don't do heroes. I just do ordinary people. Would you just be ordinary? Would you just be who you are without trying to be somebody different? Now, the next time you feel like God can't use you because you don't qualify, just remember these people. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Leah was unattractive. Joseph was abused. Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was afraid. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David was an adulterer and a murderer. Elijah was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. (laughs) Jonah ran from God. Naomi was a widow. Job went bankrupt. John the Baptist ate bugs. Oh, that's nice. Peter denied Christ. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. Zacchaeus was too small. Paul was too religious. Timothy had an ulcer and Lazarus was dead. (laughs) What an interesting list. What's my problem (laughs) compared to all of that? I mean, these are the the heroes of the faith. And and look at what they all did across the course of their lives. And, And you know, we could quote Jesus as the exception. You know, he he never sinned. But you reminded us earlier this week that he was ordinary just like us. He was uh, a man just like the rest of us, that he could do nothing except what the Father did through him. And I think it's important to remember that, Phil. And, and, and he came to show us, you know, we, we often use that phrase, and, and I'm not a fan of it, you know, what would Jesus do? As if there was a formula. Look, I've left you guys the formula, A, B, C, one, two, three. Mm. You know, this is what you do, and uh, it'll work every time. No, he never knew what he was going to do. Mm. He was just available to God. I think the answer to the question, what would Jesus do, is ask the Father. Exactly, exactly. And the Father would, you know, reveal to him what his plan was for that day, and Jesus would just be available to the Father. And so... I think I made a statement the other day that uh, Jesus could summarize his life by these words, all I ever did, I never did. It was the Father working through me. And the beauty is that for the first time since Adam was created, uh, before the fall, of course, God could be seen in a man. All that Jesus did was to present his humanity to the Father every day, and God did extraordinary things through him. Mm. I guess the main point here is something you said a couple of days ago, that God's grace shines against a backdrop of our weakness, uh, as if to say our weakness, our weaknesses don't disqualify us from being used by God, but they actually do the opposite. They almost qualify us. Absolutely, Phil. In fact, I, I think of the words of Paul right now where he said, You see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, 
But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty and base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. I remember hearing a story once of a, a very well-to-do lady. Uh, in fact, she was a lady. She was a lady. I forgot what her other name was, but she was, you know, prefixed with lady. Yes. And um, she said, I was saved by an M. <laughs> saved by an by M. By an M, a letter M. She said, I thank God that he said not many. <laughs> he did say not any wise and noble because she came from noble background. Yes. But, you know, it seems like the, the, the norm for God is to take the ordinary, to take the likes of, you know, you and I, people that just know that without the grace of God, we're nothing. We can do nothing. And even to think of somebody like a lady or a lord or, you know, somebody born into royalty yeah. even, as far as God is concerned, aren't we all the same? Absolutely, yeah. And so, so it's only a, a thing of perception. Like, you know, in, in society we have classes, so we do tend to feel inferior to those that are above us in, you know, this class sort of uh, grading system that we have. Mm. But as you say, in the eyes of God, we're just humanity. We can do the same thing in the church. We can look up to some great preacher or, or other. You think of, you know, Reinhard Bonnke, for example. Yeah. You know, here, here is a man who would be described often as a great man of God, and God has done some amazing things through him. Mm. We could say, well, you know, he he is better than us in some some respect. But, yeah. but really, he's just an ordinary guy who's been faithful. Yeah. And I think, you know, sometimes we use terms like, wow, that guy is really anointed. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is we're all anointed. The question is what are we anointed for? Yes. God has a specific role for every one of us. What is the grace of God upon your life and upon my life for? Well, you know what God has called you to do, and I know what God has called me to do. And so we just give ourselves to that and allow God to do extraordinary things we trust through us, you know. Mm. Let me just share my, my testimony, uh, Phil, um, on the subject um, you know, when, when I was um, growing up in, in my church when I was just a teenager, I remember the first time I was asked to preach, you know, at our, our youth meeting. <laughs> and, you know, I, I <laughs> knees knocking together. <laughs> well, for some reason, I picked a, I picked the Song of Solomon to <laughs> preach from that, you know. And it's all about a, being a picture of the, uh, you know, the Christ, uh, Christ and the church and you know, the bride and the bridegroom. And, and I thought, well, wow, this is, this is going to bring revival, you know, to people's lives and that sort of thing. And I was all full of confidence. And I stood up there and I looked at the people and all of a sudden I just went, man, you know, I froze. I felt myself going red, more red. And, red, and I fumbled. I could hardly lift up my eyes and look at the people. And I kept, instead of saying the groom, I said the broom. And, <laughs> and I got all my words mixed up. And, and it was just a total disaster. And, and um, my, my youth leader said to my good friend, uh, Pastor Len McGee, who is now a pastor, he said, uh, Man, he said, God is going to have to do something special in Ken if uh, if he ever does go to Bible school and makes it into the ministry. Well, you know, Phil, here I am now, 38 years being a pastor, um, you know, by the grace of God, written books and produced CDs and DVDs, uh, you know, by your kind of invitation, been on Christian radio, been on Christian TV and all this sort of thing, uh, been to several countries of the world, preaching the gospel, teaching the grace of God and so on. But knowing all the time that I'm just an ordinary person, I'm painfully aware of it. Mm. And if ever I forget it, God lets me remember it. That <laughs> it's not about me. Mm. It's about what he, an extraordinary God, can do through the likes of me, an ordinary person. Mm. Is our life mission, Ken, to find out what that extraordinary thing is that God has for us to do in his name? Is that a fair statement, do you think? Well, I believe that, you know, it is so important that we understand the grace of God that's upon us and what that grace is for. We each have a gift, and when we discover what that gift is, then we can give ourselves to doing the will of God and uh, know a sense of direction in our life. So I think somebody once said that um, there's probably no other factor that would determine the effectiveness of our lives than us being able to identify our gifts and to give ourselves to those ministries. Well, that brings us to the end of our series this week. Hope you can join us next week when we start a brand new one. Until then, remember, you don't have to carry that baggage. God wants you to be set free. For books, DVDs, small group studies and other resources from Ken Legg and details about Ken's ministry, visit kenlegg.com.au. That's K-E-N-L-E-G-G dot com dot A-U.